Alright, so now that it's Halloween and we have a new movie to talk about, I figure we'll just go ahead and talk about the three Terrifier movies kind of all at once here. And the reason this hasn't happened sooner on this channel is because, despite my undying love of horror, as you've seen over the several years we've done this, um, Terrifier is not something I got around to right away. In fact, <laughs> Um, I did not see Terrifier 1 and 2 until last month, and there's, there's several things to go into that. There was the fact that the first movie came out so quietly, and it was, like, on the streamers and stuff like that, and typically, at least back then, in, like, 2016, I think it was, um, I would, I would typically more or less ignore a movie at first, unless I heard, like, really good things about it as it went, um, so, which is exactly what happened to the first movie, so, but then I, I still kept hearing more good things and more good things, and everybody's asking me, like, have you seen that? You have to see that. And then th it was the second movie coming out, and then everything just really took off, and you started hearing all of the sort of overblown things about reactions to the movie and stuff like that. People puking and passing out and all that stuff. All the stuff that sells movies like this. Um, which, I mean, maybe it happens um, every so often, but obviously it's much more of a selling point than anything else. So that was just like, well, that just sounds unpleasant. I don't know if I'm like, like, I, like I'm at an age now where it's like, that's not necessarily something I will seek out and like really hope to see something like that. Um, but and the more you hear about just how it just goes on and on the gore like the the bedroom kill in particular is the scene that kept getting highlighted and it's like in the movie is almost two and a half hours so it's like oh i just i actually don't care about that um i'll i'll watch the other horror stuff that i watch <laughs> um but then as we got closer and closer to the third movie coming out i started to finally get a little curious cuz i was watching a lot of like horror convention videos and there's like art stuff and little pale girl stuff just like everywhere like like art got so iconic so fast like that's like iconic isn't a word i try to use lightly and that's just something that really i mean yeah 2016 when the first movie came out was a while ago but once like the spotlight hit it it was very fast <laughs> uh the whole blow up so eventually as a horror fan I just had to find out. Like, I, like, I'm clearly on the outside of something. I need to know now what all the context is for this character and some of the stuff I've heard and all that. So, I did start at the beginning. I did start with All Hallows' Eve. And I, 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 actually, I want to say something before I bring up All Hallows' Eve, and that is another thing that got me really into wanting to check this series out is seeing a lot of interviews with Damien Leone and David Howard Thornton. Like, interviews and panels and just all the stuff, basically. And, much, like, like pretty much everybody that's in horror that you see at conventions or panels or whatever, um, they just seem so nice. And, like, they just love what they're doing and they love making fans happy. And, and it's like, everything is basically for a good cause, despite the visceral nature of the movies themselves. And you'll find that so much in horror. Like, the loveliest people in the movie business typically are in horror, or make horror. And Leonie and Thornton are definitely two people that really get that vibe. And really, just anybody that comes from this franchise, it's like, you get, like, this very familial vibe. Like, everybody... Like, Anybody that's worked on these or was in them or whatever is like one big family. And so that was something where it's like, I, I, I really need to know what this is. And when you look at what Leone does specifically, because obviously he's the writer and director, but he's like he's like the editor, he does like the sound design, like visual effects, makeup effects, props. He's got so many credits on these, and that's just something that like, whether you like these movies or not, you can't ignore the passion and the love for what you're doing when he has that many jo like when so, like nearly all of the aspects of this movie have his fingerprints on it somewhere you just get the vibe of a very passionate filmmaker that you want to see succeed and it and is fascinating in a way whatever the product may be 
So I have nothing but respect for him. And that's how I want to open this before I tell you that I think All Hallows Eve is a piece of shit. Um, <laughs> and the problem with that is that I horror anthology is like part of my soul. <laughs> like that's like one of the main things I love about horror is the horror anthology movie. Um, or even sh like Tales from the Crypt. Even the show and the original movie from 72. Just everything about horror anthology is like, yes, uh, that's what I want. Like, like a lot of my favorite King stuff is his short story collections because that's just what it is. And so, I, I, going into all, ha <clears throat> going into All Hallows Eve, it just was not my thing. I just was not chilling with it at all. Um, but I don't want to get too specific with that because we're here to talk about this trilogy or trilogy as it is now. A uh, fourth one's already coming, so, um, yeah, so with all of that going in, um, and I do, I do absolutely, to my understanding, usually a director looks at, like, you know, one of the first things he did, and is like, oh, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, I've moved on so much more now, and I'm so much better now, and, oh, that was me not great, and I've gotten better, um, to my understanding, Leone's still very proud of All Hallows Eve, and I'm totally... Any director that's, like, proud of their work, um, I, I support completely. Um, I just I just don't like that movie. That's all I can say about that. So, that was my introduction to art, was a movie I felt that way about. <laughs> so, now we go into... Um, let's just go into the first movie. So, when you look at it, not only did I just mention, you know, everything Leone does on this movie... But with the budget, and the fact that even though these are getting bigger and more successful and more mainstream and everybody's talking about them, they still remain extremely low-budget movies. And that in itself is extremely appealing with what they're able to pull off and how cinematic they feel and how big they feel despite that is incredible. It's practically unthinkable the budget they make these movies on. Um, it's fantastic. So, now that we've gotten those positives in, I will just say, I'm not that into the first Terrifier movie either, and I would like to just kind of go into it. I don't. I certainly don't feel the same about it that I do about All Hallows Eve. It's a, it's a massive step up, in my opinion. Um, but w once we get to 2 and 3, that's where, that's where I feel like he really found his footing. It feel, it really feels like, to me, that All Hallows Eve was just a jumping off point to get to the first movie, which in itself was just a jumping off point. And where we're at with 2 and 3, I think is, it feels like where Leone always wanted to be. He just had to get those, he just had to get the, past those stepping stones to get to tell the story that he really wanted to tell in this big sort of epic nature. So... When you look at the first movie from that point of view, um, I will say, let's start with a, a massive positive, and that, of course, is David Howard Thornton, who is, I want to say this is his first movie, because it was um, Mike Gianelli, I think his name was, in All Hallows' Eve, um, who was incredibly scary, by the way. Like, regardless of how I feel about that movie as in itself, Art was all, started off as a very scary character. I won't deny that at all. Um, and then when you have Thornton taking over and and basically making him iconic, uh, whether it be through the expression or the body language or whatever it is, because one thing I did not know about these movies for a long time since I was so late to the party was the fact that Art is a silent character, uh, which, which is kind of amazing, <laughs> where you have a character that's this iconic and this terrifying, sometimes this funny, and no dialogue whatsoever. It's all just expression and movement and all that. And it's just, it's really stellar work. <laughs> like, really, like, like when you see David Howard Thornton, the person, and you look at Art the Clown, you, there's, it's, my mind, like, refuses to register it's the same person. Like, <laughs> like, it's insane how he's able to become something. And yeah, you could say he's under, like, a lot of makeup, but still, usually you can see something. Even if you look deeply at the Penguin, you'll see Colin Farrell eventually. Um, I don't... Rarely, but eventually, 
whether it just be eyes or something. Here, um, I cannot see one person. When I, like, they are always two separate entities, and that is something that's just insane and amazing. So, and, and with no dialogue on top of that, is it, it's really incredible. So, and the idea that not only is he a silent character, there's also many moments where he'll be at his most intimidating when he's completely still. Because you can't read what his next move is going to be. Whether it's going to be to smile at you, or to do something funny, or to do something disgusting, like what he does in the pizzeria bathroom, or maybe just jump straight into the murder. Um, and it's And this isn't like you know, typical slasher sort of murder. This is like... Like, you've seen plenty of slasher movies, you've seen plenty of elaborate kills in slasher movies over the many, many decades. But the weird... The interesting thing about Art the Clown is that on top of, you know, kill... And it might seem super excessive, that's where, you know, a lot of people don't find this appealing for very understandable reasons. But... These kill scenes that repeatedly try to top themselves as the series goes, it doesn't just feel like art kills people and then moves on. A lot of the kills go on for a while and they're torturous. You could say we're in like we're back in like the saw days of like the torture porn and stuff like that, but it's not even just that. There's something behind art's behavior that just feels well, the interesting thing about the character is that we still, three movies in, we're going to kind of be spoilery with all three of them if you haven't, like, seen the newest one. Um, but even now, after a third movie, it's still pretty vague what art is. Like, if he was once, I mean, he, he's clearly supernatural in some way now, but it's like, was he always supernatural? Did he start off human? What exactly is he and it almost feels like in his in these moments these kill moments especially it's basically like he's the he's some personification of just visceral hatred of people in general that's the vibe i get where he doesn't just kill you and move on like the kill scenes go on for a while because he's basically bullying you while he's cutting your limbs off, or chainsawing you, or whatever it is, um, scalping you, skidding you, whatever it may be. He, he does it like he's bullying the victim, while he's gruesomely killing them. And that's something that just feels different. Something that kind of feels on another level, which I imagine is what Leone was going for, in regards to making something that feels kind of fresh, and something, not just fresh, but something that's clearly taken off in the way it has. There's clearly something here, because we've had multiple slasher eras before, um, but this one does feel like it's, it goes a little beyond this typical understanding of what a slasher movie is, where it's like, because I wouldn't consider the Saw movies slasher movies, necessarily. When I think slasher movies, I think of a dude with a blade of some kind or something. And obviously, art's weapons vary, but for the most part, it's the same style. Like, it's a killer. We have a cast of characters that gets killed one by one, and then there's a final person and a final confrontation. That's exactly what the formula is <laughs> um, for slasher movies. But this one just, these just feel like another monster entirely, because art is another monster entirely, entirely, literally. So, um, to talk about more details of the movie itself, um, as we'll continue, we'll kind of go, like, through the movie a little bit, I guess. So to start with this opening scene where we see Victoria for the first time, where she's clearly been through this horrific massacre and she's on this talk show. You, you know this. You have all seen the movie. Um, but what I like about this is the way we build it up at first, where, like, the static uh, obscures her face for a little bit before she's revealed. And then 
the fact that the first startling image of the movie is not the killer himself, but something he did a year ago. Um, so, like, the result of something he did a year ago when we see this. And then, and it's also interesting to open up with the first person that is attacked in this movie is not, it, it's not a typical victim. Because typically, you know, it'll open and it'll be some character that we've never met before that seems kind of innocent or oblivious or something, and then they're killed by whoever the killer of the movie is. Um, this person, is, the interviewer, is introduced as a piece, a kind of a piece of shit, um, and then is attacked in a very gruesome fashion by somebody that's not the main killer of the movie. So right away, it already feels like there's something new going on here. Like, there's a wrench being thrown into what we would typically expect from a movie that basically is what the first movie is, which is just a slasher movie, plain and simple. But there's so many questions brought in by this opening scene, because we already know going in... Like, it's not one of those... Mis like, a lot of slasher movies are the killer's a mystery that you have to figure out as you go, and it's somebody else in the cast. Going into this movie, you know it's like, it's a killer clown movie. You know, like, Arthur Clown's face. He's literally all of the advertisement. So, going in with that many questions after a first scene, and seeing what other characters are capable of in very gruesome fashion, that's, a, that's just a really interesting um, and intriguing start. And then it becomes the movie we pretty much expect it to be, which is... Art kills people for about an hour and 15 minutes, and then it ends. So that's where um, I love the simplicity of the slasher genre, where it's like, I'm saying that, but it's like, I don't really need more out of a slasher movie than just a slasher slashing. So when you bring in an interesting character like this, because you talk about clowns in general, and... A lot of people can probably tell you that clowns might be played out. I don't. I think. I think evil clowns are always kind of interesting, and so whether it be you know Pennywise or the Joker or Terrifier or whoever we're talking about, there's something about a bright white face with a smile on it, doing evil things and often contrasting with their background. Something about that image will just kind of never get old to me. So, and even though. Art certainly isn't as colorful as uh, you typically imagine when you think of clowns. Like, just the white and black, and that's basically all he is, uh, color-wise. But there's still something about the white face and the playful nature that just is really fascinating when put with a dark background. So that's a cliche that I will always check out at some point. Um, whether it be late or not. Um, I will, eventually. But what I did know about this pizzeria scene, it's something I had heard about many times before I actually saw it, and the fact that it's, it's, there's not much to the scene. He sits in the booth, and he just does his different clown gestures to them, uh, like he's trying to charm Tara, and that's... And yet, this scene is basically iconic when you look at this character being a new iconic horror figure and this being, like, one of his introductory scenes to the fan base, who they are now. And to my understanding, I want to say Thornton has said that those were improvised moments, most of them at least, if not all of them, um, where he just kind of gestures in various different ways and there's just something so off-putting about it, especially, like I said, when it's just like, it's almost like he goes into a shutdown mode where he puts on a serious face and you cannot snap him out of it. Um, that's when it gets, like, really unsettling. And then when he comes back, after he's already had unsettling moments, I mean, even though he's, you know, a clown, you can already see in his face that <laughs> um, there's something unsettling about his features. But it's really through the behavior that something really sets in, that gets under your skin. So once he's done the sort of shut down, serious face for a while, and then goes back into happy and playful, 
that feeling never goes away. Like, he's almost, like, it's almost creepier that he snaps back into happy mode and jokey mode and clown mode um, after a moment that seems dark. And so that basically being his sort of introduction to the world, more or less, um, is this is the scene, the first standout scene. So that's, I can, I can get behind that. That's great. And then we have our characters like Tara and her friend, and the, the character names and development in this one don't really matter that much. The only person that we really have to worry about is Victoria. And it is very interesting to look at how the series ends up so far. When you lo look back at this scene where Victoria has a test to take, she has to be up in like five hours, and she doesn't want to come out and get Tara. So there was a moment where Victoria was not going to leave that night. <laughs> um, and she was going to just stay in and do her test, and Tara was going to have to find another way home. Um, and then her roommate came in and decided she wanted to bang her boyfriend, and that's what made Victoria say, all right, I'll leave. So this couple deciding to bang that night feels like it's set off so much. It's a much more, I will say... The first movie is much more interesting now that we have all the other context of the first two so far movies. Um, so it is something that, like on rewatch, because I have I've watched both of these um, again since I saw them the first time last month, um, right before I saw the third movie. So with that in mind, like we have stuff like there's this radio ad for a uh, Craven's Halloween store that's like a costume shop. I don't remember if they say specifically the name in the second movie, but I'm going to assume that's the costume shop from the big scene in the second movie. So you can sense that there was, like I was talking about before, there was always an idea to use these as stepping stones and make a much bigger picture and a much bigger story. And this one just feels like we had to make this as small as we could before we jumped off to that point so we could basically prove ourselves. So... It is really from this point on that it just becomes kill after kill after kill after kill after kill after kill, um, and so on, and until the movie just ends. And like I said, that's usually all I ask for in a slasher movie. But like I said, when you're dealing with a killer that's as brutal and willing to drag the murders out the way art is, it does feel like it's... It's a, it's a it's a very long hour and 24 minutes. Like in, like in any other case, a movie with this runtime would feel very short and very quick. And almost like you didn't put enough in it. Um, this one is... It, it feels very long and like it's really reaching and dragging as much as it possibly can to reach a very short runtime. So we're basically looking at like a, a demo reel of what... Leona can do as far as like the gore effects go and I've made this argument before as well and that is you can say that there's nothing behind a movie that's just gore which is pretty much bullshit because an, an artist a visual effects artist and a makeup artist have to make that come to life like when you have a visceral reaction to watching gore in a movie somebody had to make the gore convincing enough to make you have that reaction so there's artistry behind you being repulsed by a gory movie so that's something that i can absolutely compliment this movie for uh but as far as because here here's the thing is what a lot of slasher movies also do that they often don't get credit for is they usually have a lot of character buildup before the slashing actually starts. Whether you actually care about the characters or not sometimes may come into play, it sometimes probably won't, but there's still a lot of character stuff going on, whereas this one is a lot of we're introducing this character just for them to die. Like, we introduce them, and then 30 seconds later, they're being slashed for more time than they had in the movie than when they weren't being slashed. So, <laughs> and that's like, like, a, like a, the most egregious example, I guess, would be the guy, the other worker that comes in towards the end that I don't, we might, we maybe we saw him like once before for like a second, 
Um, but he's he's a character we essentially don't know, and then he comes in and gets a very a very prolonged decapitation, and that's the kind of thing where it feels like the movie feels a bit empty. Like I was talking about with um, the Wind of the Pooh Blood and Honey movies, I used the term empty a lot when I was talking about those, the, the first one especially of those. Um, but it is interesting to see how like the gore escalates. Because when it starts off, we don't see... There's the opening scene, yes, but, like, the first art kill, I want to say, is when he takes the pizzeria guy's head and makes it like a jack-o'-lantern, which is something that happens off-screen. We just find that. Um, and then the other guy is killed gruesomely, but minorly gruesomely when you look at the rest of the kills. Um, and then eventually we get to the point to where he saws the friend in half. And it's at that point where you can kind of see this gradual escalation of what the gore was doing. And then once the sawing scene happens, it's basically a free-for-all. Like, we're, we're good to go. We have opened the doors. <laughs> and this just wave of the gruesome kills is what the rest of the movie is. And so that's when... There, there, it's not without, like, suspense, which is another thing that could often be, often be missing from these that you'll want. So we do have moments where he's, like, you know, stalking around, and he kind of chases Tara around for a while, um, which is suspenseful enough. And then there's moments where, like, he'll pop up unexpectedly, and those are moments um, that are key when your movie feels maybe like it's going to get a little monotonous. So when you get moments like when the friend's in the car by herself and she thinks Tara gets in and she looks over and it's art and it's like the first time we're seeing him since the pizzeria so it's very sort of sudden and jarring and that's really effective um or the scene where he appears with like the scalpel so moments like that and the fact that it's his like his appearance and design and all of that um but just the moments themselves also are startling in this very effective way the way like one of the things you come to a movie like this for that's not just the gore where you can do you know more than just going for that once you've started that once you once you've gotten the gore ball rolling um and kind of still finding those moments of maybe using suspense or maybe use this you know jarring cut or something um but it does kind of start to drown in gore more or less and it does come to a moment that I suppose is a another case of let's kind of make this a refreshing slash movie, like something that the audience isn't quite expecting while also getting what they want. So while they're getting the gore and the kills, there is an interesting moment where we set up, we've been setting up for the movie, it feels like Tara is a final girl, is what it feels like, at least to me. Um, and, and it seems very intentional because we set her up and then maybe about half it's like maybe right at the halfway point or about that um tara is killed where and, and the thing about that is right before tara is killed what you might start to notice is the fact that there is a lot of fighting back between tara and art where it's not just tara being terrorized where there's a lot of moments where she gets hits in and, like, knocks him down, and he doesn't seem like... Like, he he's ruthless, but he also takes his share of hits. And so they set that up, like, this is going to be a formidable sort of match between the two of them, and then just when you're setting up... Because we've seen his when, like, he was about to kill the friend, he went through, like, his arsenal of weapons, like his trash bag of, like, you know, different blades and saws and stuff like that. And so we're setting up that that's what he does. He slashes and he hacks and he saws and he does that whole thing. So just when you're prepared for Terra to be the ultimate foe for this slasher with all of his blades and saws, he just pulls out a gun and ends that. Halfway through the movie, <laughs> we lose our final girl to a gun very suddenly. And we realize that his weapons are not... He's not picky about his weapons. <laughs> if it kills you, it kills you. And that's what matters. So that's something that is very interesting. 
But this is also the point where I feel like it kind of loses me. Where it's like, it sort of peaks at that moment. Like, that's the moment that grabs you. And it's like, holy shit, you can do that? You can, like, you can have this character suddenly pull out a gun and make Terra not the final girl by any means halfway through the movie? That's insane. Um, like, the, he, like, he kind of brought the Janet Lee thing back in a very extreme example. So that leaves another half of a very short movie. Um, and then it just becomes like, oh, here's like the homeless cat lady with the doll baby or whatever. And so he's gonna, you know, cut her up and wear her skin around like Buffalo Bill. And then we're gonna introduce other characters just to kill them. And then he, he you know, ri he like rips the skin off the guy's head and does all that stuff. And then it's at this point where it's like, all right, you, uh, you have peaked at this point. So then it kind of becomes pretty repetitive and you kind of start to grow. Not it's, it's gruesome enough that you'd never quite grow desensitized <laughs> by any means, but, um, it does just feel like it, like it, like it peaked in the middle and then we just kind of had to finish it off until we circle back around to how Victoria got to be both on the show and insane in her own way. So, but there's a lot, there's a whole other half of movie that feels very, very long to get to that point, and that's where it just kind of, yeah, it, it, it's, and what I was talking about was the idea of it being more rewatchable once you have full context of the series. Even at that point, uh, it feels like, yeah, I get it, and there's not really much of interest in the rest of the kills here of these random people. Just every now and then a moment does creep in where you once again wonder what art is. And so, like, like the idea that art knows how a phone works, which is something that may not have been clear when you don't know what he is. So it's like, when he can send a misleading text in order to lure somebody, or when he knows how to, like, use a, the camera in the phone... Those are things that I wouldn't imagine somebody otherworldly would be able to do. So that's another thing that kind of puts him in this really interesting, ambiguous territory. But once again, there's always the question of, was he supernatural prior to his death at the end of this movie? Uh, we're we're going to find out. But before that, um, oh, I also talk, also talking about just respect for Leone and his love for the fans. Um, it's also just endearing to watch the credits roll in the movie and see all of the um, the Indiegogo backers have a f like are actually in the credits. Um, it's something that's really this really nice gesture of gratitude uh, to the fan base. So that's that's a nice way to sort of send off the first movie um, after that just sort of ongoing circle of gore that the second half is that's less appealing than the first half. But now we can go into the second movie, which I like so much more. Um, there's because once again, like everybody else, I was a little concerned about that runtime. I was actually I was very 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 concerned about that runtime when I, because it's like I was just saying um, the first movie seems like it struggles so much to get to a short uh, runtime, and the way it did that was hard to look at gruesome kill after hard to look at gruesome kill and it's like okay um and it's like oh now you're adding an hour it's gonna be an it's gonna be that runtime plus another entire hour and and you're hearing things in the media about people puking and passing out and doing all that stuff so <laughs> it's like oh right but um there's a reason it is. There's mostly a reason this one's as long as it is. It has a very, very long climax that doesn't need to be long, but that's kind of another slasher staple, I guess. Is a, Many slashers have a very, very long climax that doesn't need to be. But, um, so, like I was saying, it does feel like the whole point of starting at All Hallows' Eve and then going through the first movie, the point was to end up at this movie and then tell a big story. And that's uh, what we do when we get here. And I love the fact that, once again, still working on a very, very minuscule budget, yet making the movie feel much bigger. Um, but I like the idea of the direct continuation. The fact that we kind of have the ongoing timelines going on where it's like, 
there's a year between the main events of the first movie and Victoria being on the talk show. And this one still goes by that, where we see the little pale girl watching that interview as it's happening after we've had the moment that directly continues where the first one ended the year prior where he was able to resurrect himself by doing the Jeepers Creepers thing to the morgue attendant. Um, in very, very gruesome fashion. I was, ta I was talking about the, uh, the escalation of gore in the first movie. Well, we already went through that, so we can start at the top <laughs> how the gore goes, and so this, uh, like, it's one thing where he takes the guy's eye out, and another thing where he takes the brain out. Um, it's the splitting of the head that's Jesus Christ. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, and like, I was saying, like, we're working on such a low budget, and these effects are the ones that get such a visceral reaction because there's so much actual passion and just a, the practical nature of them. It's like you can't help but admire it while you're absolutely revolted and you can barely look at it at all. You, there's, I, I will admit, there is a bit, I've gotten significantly less squeamish as the years have gone on. I think we might have talked about this in the Hatchet series. Just watch the Hatchet series all together, all four of them. You're probably good to go on most gore for the rest of your life. Um, anything that's, as, as long as it's fake. <laughs> um, which is something we'll kind of talk about that kind of becomes a theme of these next ones about the separation of the real violence and how this is clearly fake gore. Um, as disgusting as it is and has as many body parts inner body parts as you may recognize as they come out, still um, there is this very sort of fake and playful nature to the gore on top of being horrifying and disgusting. But, um, yeah, so anyway, going on to the following scene, which is the laundry scene, and this is something, this sets up something that I feel like was really missing from the first movie also. something There's moments where I feel like they tried to have moments like this in the first movie, that were like that were showing art's playful nature this, and this is after the pizza this is like after we've gotten way deep in but like when there's like 10 or 15 minutes of the movie left like every now and then he'll like you know use the horn or something like that um but it all just feels really sort of mean-spirited and repulsive that second half so and that bullying nature i was talking about that art as a character has a lot of people put that on leone and say oh he must be like that as a person to make this movie um, no, it, art is obviously a character, and that's, that character, the nature of that character is what makes what art does feel so mean-spirited on top of being, you know, gruesome murder. I know that seem, might seem redundant, but surely you get what I mean. So, looking at this, when he goes into the laundromat, and we get to watch art being mundane... Um, or the moment where he's reading the paper and, like, silently cackling when he sees an article about a family of four dying in a car accident. This is the kind of thing I feel like was really missing from the first movie that it really needed. These moments where it's like, yeah, there's, like, dark humor in there, but the, I mean, you can even say, like, when he's running around like Buffalo Bill with the, you know, the cat lady on him, um, that that's, you know, dark humor and stuff like that. But this... This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about, like where it's art reading a newspaper and laughing at dead families and stuff like that, and the, and watching him do mundane things, and that's the thing where it's like, and he usually does them like, like there's like there's a before we even get there, there's a moment in three where after he's committed a murder, he washes the dishes, and it's like that that's the kind of thing that I feel like it. Is something I'd really like. I really like the focus being on when we talk about the dark humor and the kind of character that Art is post murder when he's not murdering and being this sort of <laughs> whatever he is. And so, once this laundry scene happened in one of the first scenes of the second movie, that's when I felt like, okay, now I think I I think I'm starting to like where we're going already, and that carried through through the second movie. I'm really happy to say. So, another thing we did here... Actually, we're introducing a couple of new elements here. While we're still in the laundromat, we go into The Little Pale Girl, which is a very interesting addition. It is, to my understanding... I had a conversation with a friend shortly after I watched these for the first time, and we were talking about how it, it was... I've, I've been a kid that liked things I probably shouldn't have liked as a kid, so I understand where this is coming from. 
but these movies are so extreme and art comes from like i said almost this place of hatred of people and this bullying nature as he does these gruesome things i i find it interesting that kids like these movies and that's like a whole thing um so <laughs> but like i said it's you know if i was a kid now i i don't know how i would feel about these um, but I, I liked other things that kids maybe aren't supposed to like when I was a kid, so that's a whole thing in itself. And I want to say I heard in one of these interviews that Leone said that he saw a girl, a, a, a little girl, at a horror convention in art makeup, and that was his inspiration for the little pale girl's character. Um, so the fact that that's like this whole character, not only is she probably one of the creepiest elements of the movie, um, I wish I could remember the actress's name, but she's fantastic, and much like Thornton, only has body language and expression to go on. It's a silent character as well. Um, and to be that age, to do physical acting that well, in, in a, horror, um, a horror movie like this especially, um, is incredible, but... But yeah, that also that character also basically being like an ode to the young fans of the series. Um, as odd as it may be to certain people that this movie has a young a fan base that young. But uh, yeah, so uh, there's that. And we also have, um, um, oh my god, Lauren Lavera. I, I was, do not forget her name. <laughs> do not forget Sienna's name. Um, is our sort of lead character now and are who and that's the interesting thing is the fact that the first movie doesn't have a final girl because art the clown's final girl was not even in the first movie she's introduced in this movie and it does feel like the direction we're going like i said we are getting in spoiler territory for some reason you're watching this terrifier video and you've gone this long in it without having seen these for some reason um the fact that it almost seems like, if I'm not mistaken, Sienna's basically becoming a superhero as we go on. And the reason I use that term is the fact that what makes it interesting is usually it's like a first movie in a franchise will introduce a superhero and we get that whole thing, a backstory, how they came to be, and just what they are in general. And then you might have a villain and then you have a second movie that's like a big villain like a super villain, like the super villain. So what's interesting about this series is what has basically happened is we had an entire first movie that introduces a super villain and then the second movie introduces the superhero that might be able to bring an end to this. Um, so that whole concept is very interesting. That's something that had to grow on me as it went because I was not aware of just how far we were heading in that direction when I first went into these movies. Um, I didn't know how grounded we were, but I didn't know we were going that um, into like the fantasy element of it. But now that, that that whole thing has grown on me and that I feel like we're going in that direction and that's the way to look at it as a superhero, super villain kind of thing, um, that's really interesting and definitely makes me want to see like where we're going. So... We get a lot of this character's background and her brother Jonathan and this whole setup and the tragic background they come from with their dad, um, who's, you know, had this artistic vision that may or may not coincide with what's going on here in this almost sort of psychic way. We're also kind of getting the third movie a little bit talking about that, but it's, yeah, when you're talking about it as a whole, um, it's very, uh, it, it, it's a very unexpected direction. And, goes more even it really doubles down on the we're really trying to do something fresh here um while kind of starting as a slasher movie and then turning into what this gigantic good versus evil thing is gonna be um and it's get it's getting really big and really wild really fast um but on the other side of that if you want to talk about a more grounded thing that's going on here um the idea of bringing like real life violence into it there's an interesting thing that comes up here with jonathan's character where he's really into the art the clown stuff which of course in this universe is true crime stuff because the massacre is a real thing that just happened a year prior to what's going on here so 
with all that in mind and the fact that all these people were actually killed and this character Jonathan who is a child is kind of becoming obsessed with it wants to go out as art for Halloween um, Sienna steps in and has this moment of like why and the mom come in and are like you know why do you want to glorify this real killer and so it's that whole thing of you might say that's a that's a conversation that's very interesting to have right now because of how popular true crime is and like documentaries and like mini series and like big actors playing these killers and stuff like that and actual real life murders being recreated for TV um, and, and it just it just feels fucking gross. <laughs> Um, and so, you look at that, and you see this movie that comes in, and we have this discussion about glorifying real killers. And the idea of somebody might counter that with, well, who is Damien Leone, the guy that makes these movies, to say about how that's portrayed? And it's like, these movies are incredibly fictional. He's, Damien Leone's going out of his way as you can see as this story develops, to make this as fictional <laughs> as possible. People have superpowers now. Um, so you kind of can look at that when you sort of question your own idea of, well, what is it that I find entertaining about these movies that I don't find entertaining about when it happens in real life? And it's like... Well, the the main conclusion you can come to right away, that's the most obvious, is just how incredibly over-the-top this has been since the beginning. One of the examples I always use when we're talking about, like, you know, over-the-top stuff is a movie that's actually an homage, um, which is Planet Terror. So it's like, when people ask me sometimes, like, how gory a movie is, and if it's, like, hard to take, I'll say, like, it's whether it's realistic or it's Planet Terror gore. Is what I'll is typically what I'll say, and they'll get what I mean. Um, but that's obviously been a thing since like you know the Romero days and beyond, um, where it's like it's so over the top and so outlandish, um, and people get like ripped apart so easily. Um, it, there's just so there's just such a line between real life violence and what these movies are. So I feel like it's a it's very interesting to bring that outlook into this particular franchise that has so much attention and is so popular for being movies that feature very prolonged scenes of gore and people being ripped to pieces and tortured. Um, like, there's definitely something sincere coming from, but let's, like, not glorifying real life violence, which is a very different thing. So, that's how I uh, take to that sort of thing, but I can see where people would have, like, you know, different outlooks on if these movies have any room to talk about what violence is okay and what isn't and stuff like that. I think it's really interesting to throw that in. So um, that's what I was saying in a very roundabout way. So, um, but yeah, to talk about now about how I think this movie is different from the gore scenes in the first movie, where like I said, there's really not a lot of anything going on in the first movie when the killing starts. It's just kind of the killing. So what I really love here and what the bigger runtime gives us time to do is we have whole sequences now that lead up to the kills and they're very entertaining sequences, especially through Thornton's performance. <laughs> so when you look at stuff like, uh, the, uh, first of all, the Clown Cafe scene was another scene that really won me over quickly. Where like It was another case of me going, yes, more of that. Um, where Sienna has this nightmare about the Clown Cafe, and it's just this... Like, I was saying before in the Needful Things video we just did, how much I love long scenes. Um, and not just long scenes that are the same thing, but long scenes that are clearly building in a certain way and are going to climax in a certain way, um, but have fun along the way. It, it really suck us in along the way and put us right in there. There's several scenes that I love in this movie because of that. Because they're sort of long, and because it feels like we know a point... We're, we're getting to the big gruesome kill scene, but what is Art going to do in the meantime? Or Not even just Art, what else in general is going to happen in the meantime? So when you look at this Clown Cafe scene, and it's just so surreal, and these weird dream elements come into it, like there's people that don't belong, like 
the nun and the homeless guy, but we're also on like a kids TV show, but we're also in a commercial, and it's just all kinds of different things going on, and it's getting weirder and more manic, and it's just like, you know it's going to escalate, but you don't quite know how it's going to escalate, and then it, and it just gets more and more gruesome and weird, and it's just... Yeah, that's the kind of thing that I that I love horror, when horror plays with something like that, of just taking you in this nightmarish place where you just have no idea what the next second is going to be. And you just, and you feel like you're you feel like you as the viewer are descending into insanity watching this. Um and it's it's exhilarating. As a horror fan, it's a really exhilarating feeling. Um, and I love it. I also love the costume shop scene, where, yeah, we are leading to the gruesome kill of the clerk. And But that's the thing, is I was talking about that worker at the end, towards the end of the first movie, where it's like he's introduced, and he's like, oh, hey, where, where's my other buddy, or whatever, and then he's just very, for a very long time, decapitated. Um, and it's like, you could say, oh, well, we just met this clerk, um, and then he's immediately killed, but we get this whole sequence... <laughs> Um, where Sienna's at the store, and she's, you know, getting the wings, and she's like, oh, I forgot my bag, and then Art just appears and drops it, and then Art just lingers around. This blew my mind, in a good, in a good way, a really good way. It shows how impressive this movie is. Um, whenever I would watch, like, horror convention videos, and I would watch a lot, I go down rabbit holes, I love watching horror convention videos, um, because I hate crowds, and I get to live vicariously through them. So, um, one of the m main looks you will see Art have, like, one of his most iconic looks is him wearing those flower glasses. And that's a costume you see everywhere. You see it in costume, you see it in fan art, like, paintings, all that stuff, merchandise, so much stuff with art in the flower glasses. Anybody that hasn't even seen these movies probably assumes that is a major look for art. There is one shot in this two hour and 20 minute movie that lasts for maybe a second and a half where he's wearing those glasses and that's it. And it, in one and a half seconds of screen time, that look essentially became iconic to this character and and became all that I was just talking about that is wild to me but it really shows the impact these little moments and these little details can have I want to say that's another thing Thornton said may have been improvised was him just at the sunglasses rack just doing things um and so that's like that's amazing to me and so it, these are the moments this and then once Sienna leaves and it's just him and the clerk um and there's more of that play going on here and that's like this is the kind of stuff that the first movie was missing as well not only is it just I don't want to just dwell on the fact that the first movie didn't have these kinds of moments um but how valuable these moments are anyway like regardless of whether they were in the first movie or not um, just the fact that they exist in this one is, you can tell they really found the right tone to go for with what they were doing here. Um, and then to have the follow-up scene where he looks like he's holding a prop head to the mother and child, uh, is, yeah. So, another scene that fits this mold is the trick-or-treat scene, where he's at the door of her friend trying to trick-or-treat for what seems like a while, but I love how long this scene goes on, because once again, even though the great thing about Art is that we've seen so much of what he does now, yet still, no matter how much we've seen him do already, from scene to scene, he still feels unpredictable. Where we don't know if it's going to be a joke, or a smile, or a glare, or an insta-kill, or he's just going to leave. We have no idea what his next move is going to be from person to person, no matter what we've seen before. And so that is... So just watching this scene go on for a long time, now that that has all been established, is really... I really love that scene. And once again, another follow-up scene when he comes... Up. Well, we have the whole bedroom kill, then we have the moment 
um, this seems like a sequel scene to the trick or treat scene previously, where he uses the mom's head as a candy bucket, which is insane. So, that's actually something else I want to talk about. Um, when we get to uh, long scenes, I will say this: I totally get the reaction that the bedroom kill scene got. Um, but what was interesting about my experience with the bedroom kill scene is, <laughs> once again, I only saw the movie for the first time last month, so it's been out for a couple of years now. So, looking at it from that perspective, the thing is, this was the scene that was really, really built up, and it was like, I had heard, like, you know, he skins a girl, he goes and gets salt and bleach, he dumps it on her, and it goes on and on and on and on. And so, here's the thing. Once again, I've also got it in my mind the movie's two hours and twenty minutes. So, the way it's being built up to me, I imagine it's two hours and twenty minutes of torture porn. So, when I hear about this scene many, many times, at some point it got in my head that this was like a scene that was fifteen minutes long. So I'm imagining, like, he's skinning her very slowly, and it, like, goes on and on. Like, you know, he's ripping off body parts, doing that whole thing. He scalps her, he does that whole thing. Um, and it goes for, like, 15 minutes, what I'm imagining. And 15 minutes is a very, very long time. So when I actually saw this scene, and it's over in, like, two to three minutes, and, like, you know, he scalps her, he, like, rips her limbs off, he rips her back open, and then he leaves for a second, he comes back with the salt and the bleach and all that. It was all, from what I was imagining, it was all over very quickly for me. So, I don't think I have, because, and the reason I say I understand is because I can imagine if you're not prepared for that scene, because I, like I said, I had heard about that scene so many times, and it gotten, like, every time I heard it, it was, like, blown out of proportion more and more. So... If you were watching that scene, especially in a movie theater, if you're watching that scene for the first time and you haven't heard about it and you don't know what's coming, I totally buy it probably felt like that scene went for 15 minutes. It went on and on and on and on. I totally get that. But I will just say that it wasn't as unpleasant as I had built myself up for. It's still fucking disgusting and revolting and just, and just the worst. But... This is another Leone moment I definitely wanted to talk about, and I'm so glad I heard him say this in a recent interview, because um, talking about the idea of the separation of real-life violence and the big over-the-top stuff we're doing here, the thing about it is this movie is also intended to be scary. Um, it's also meant to be fun and funny at times, um, but also, like, like, it's, like it, it's, it's actually darkly funny, that he leaves for a long time and comes back with salt and bleach. Like, that's like, that's like a joke. Um, which is, <laughs> um, just also happens to be torture. So, for us to watch and for the, literally for the character, obviously. But, um, the fact that this, the thing that got me the most, and like I said, I was so glad to hear him talk about it specifically, because this is the part that got me the most was the aftermath when the mom walks in and she's sitting up in the bed after everything has happened. That's the shot that made me feel sick. Um, and the fact that Leone has said that apparently <clears throat> apparently there's a very famous picture of a Jack the Ripper victim that he saw once and it stuck with him. And because not because he enjoyed it, like many who criticize these movies might think is what somebody that would make this movie would think about an image like that, it was the fact that it, like, disturbed him and scared him that he thought, why don't we homage it in this moment um, and bring that fear into this? So it's still a very over-the-top scene, but then when it's actually supposed to be scary and disturbing, there's that hint, there's that homage, still not real life, but an homage to real life to bring in the disturbing nature of it. Um, that's, there's a very careful balance there, um, and I like the fact that he brought in something that he himself is genuinely disturbed by, um, and kind of fitted into what was going on here without, you know, abandoning the over-the-top nature of everything that came before it. Because, like I said, it wasn't the violence itself 
that comes from real life. It was that one moment of aftermath, after everything's happened. That's the part that he pulled from real life and kind of recreated a little bit. So I find that very interesting about that scene as well. So there's also a lot of character moments going on. There's much more room for character now because we've got that runtime on top of the long scenes. So we've got stuff like the mother. I like the fact that the mother is as um, complicated of a character as she is because she's she's a very hard character to like, but at the same time she is a widow with two children who had a husband who was unwell. So it's clear why she's in the state that she's in. Um, but she's also, she's very aggressive. She's very aggressive. <laughs> um, and but I, I like moments like that where it's like, after the moment where the fire has happened, and she's confronting Sienna about it, and she's being very kind of brutal, and then at the end of the scene, even though she's still angry, she's still an angry tone, she says, you can sleep in my bed. And I feel like just something like that says so much about the character, and it says so much about the scene later that might seem like a bit of manipulation, because you always have the moment where the characters say they love each other, and it's like, I don't say that enough, you know, I should really express more how much I care about you. Right before one of the characters dies brutally and has mashed potatoes stuffed into their face, um, the, not just their face, the hole that was once their face, um... <laughs> And so, but the fact that they established that to where there is a very buried love here between the characters, and that the characters are, like, realistically complicated like that, where you can have, like, you know, a family member or something, or somebody that you love unconditionally, and have a lot of, there's a lot of negativity in there that might bury that, um, but then every now and then those moments come in, like, you can sleep in my bed or something like that. Um, and that's, like, that's pretty powerful character work here. There, I also like the way the backstory about the dad was treated. For one specific reason, there's a moment as we're getting to the climax where it's her friend that tells the backstory to her boyfriend about what happened to Sienna and Jonathan's dad. And the reason I like that so much is that it... Even if a movie has really good character development, it's always so painfully obvious to me in any movie, good or bad, when a character is dumping their tragic backstory so that it can either play a part later or it gives them more depth or whatever it may be. It feels very script 101 when you hear a character giving their own backstory. Like I said, regardless of if it's well done or not, it's still very identifiable of... This is the part in the script where we have to do this so that we have good character development. Um, so the idea of another person providing the backstory when the other person isn't present feels much more natural to me. So I really like that scene just based on that alone. So I can appreciate that because it is starting to play a massive part. Her dad's story is, about, is starting to play a massive part in what's going on here. So this is information we have to get out there. So, I really like the way that was done. But then, yeah, like I said, once all this has happened, we have a very long climax. And, like I said, a very long slasher climax can be very exhausting. Let's not even go into Rob Zombie's movies, which every single one is just a very, very long, long climax. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, fight, good versus evil, we're bringing in these big, more fantastical elements and Art is seemingly beaten when he is decapitated with this magic sword. And then the little pale girl picks his head up and walks away, and then we get our mid credit scene where Victoria gives birth to his head. That's a hell of a cliffhanger. <laughs> so, why don't we get right into the third movie now? Like I said, this is a pretty brand new movie, so I will just go ahead and say right now, we've already kind of said some spoilery things about it, but um, we're probably gonna... Get, I'm not gonna go like all the way through all the details of the ending or anything like that, but just things might come up if you haven't seen it. So that's where we are now. So, yeah. I'm talking about how I've been saying that Art is like a bully on top of being the vicious murderer that he is. And he's supernatural at this point as well. So just this mean, hateful nature 
that's just Art's general aura is now coming to a head when it was announced that this was going this movie in particular was going to be set at Christmas. So we are getting a Christmas horror movie now with Terrifier 3. The first poster, I believe, was him with Santa's skin face hanging around his neck, which is not quite what happens, but it's pretty close. <laughs> but um, we do start with an opening scene that, like I said, it can, it can be very sort of mean-spirited and that whole thing, where we open with a family of four being murdered on... It feels a lot like Christmas Eve, and there's a lot of Christmas Eve clues going on, but it also, the mom's dialogue makes it sound like we're still a few days off from Christmas Eve, so I don't know exactly when the hell this scene takes place, but, um, yeah, it's a family, it's Christmas, it's two parents, two children, one of which is a little girl we're kind of following as she hears something on the roof, and we know already this is going to be Art killing them. Or do we? Because the the first movie does start with somebody else getting a gruesome kill in, but it, it, it's Art. Um, a, after he's already gotten his Santa get up, we're, like I said, we're playing with the timeline just a little bit again, like we tend to do in this series in this nice, fun way that's not too complicated. And so, a, and, and so eventually we see Art with this axe that looks very blunt, and it's. The brutality happens right away, because not only does he have this sort of blunt axe, but it's one of those ones where he doesn't even have to be... We don't even have to be seeing it. He will go into a room where a child is, and then we'll just hear the sound effect. And the sound effects, without us even seeing anything, are just so heavy. Like, you feel the weight of an axe hitting a body through sound without us even looking at anything. That's how this movie begins. And then we get on screen, you know, chopping and blood and limbs and all that fun stuff. This is what I was talking about where um, he has this note where he eats cookies gleefully and milk and he's getting blood all over everything. But he still has his Art the Clown decency to wash his dishes and even put them on the, like the drying rack when he's done before he leaves. Um, and by the way, most of this is to no music. Like, when he does the first couple of kills or so, there's, like, not even music. It's just the sound effects of him walking around and then the axe making contact. And then eventually we get to the number, like, Christmas music plays as we're getting to the title reveal. So, that's the opening scene. I, had, I remember... Because, of course, as soon as these Terrifier movies start screening, um, all these hyperbolic things start coming out about how, oh, this is the most, you know, horrific thing you'll ever see, you need a barf bag, all that stuff, and all oh, this opening scene is one of the most disturbing things ever. Um, it's, it's, it's on par. I mean, it's like, it's like, like, if you're, like, I don't really feel like we're going too much above and beyond what's going on here. Like, it's gotten to the point where it's kind of consistent now, um, which is not a bad place to be, so... Um, there's that. But I was talking about these moments of, like, dark comedy and, like, om almost, like, light moments amongst the horror and the gore. And so this is, once again, what I was talking about. This is what I was looking for with that kind of thing. So we have moments where it's, like, because Art was decapitated at the end of the second movie and we know, we know where his head is now, um this idea of his headless body walking around is almost comedic in nature in itself. And then, like, there's this sort of... Re we just talked about Reanimator, um, where there's a funny moment in Reanimator where a headless body walks around and puts another head on. Um, now, mind you, in Reanimator, it's like a fake head for, like, an anatomy class. Um, in this, it's another person's head. He rips off a dude's head and just puts it on his own until he <laughs> until he gets back to his that's quite funny, <laughs> especially when you're, you know, in tune with these movies, finally. And then there's another moment later when we get the continuation of the mid credit scene um, with Chris Jericho and the other nurse being killed. And when Jericho walks in, and it's right where we picked up exactly the way we went from one to two, um, it's just Art's head by itself eating this nurse. I'm not going to lie, that's a pretty funny image. And it's, and it's, like, it's the dark comedy that I'm looking for in these. I love it. 
Um, <laughs> so, once again, like the second movie, I'm starting off right away with, okay, this is what I was looking for. Yes. So, much like the second movie, uh, I was I was on board right from the start of this one, and we went on. So, and, and, and it continues. Um, when you talk about more of this darkly funny stuff, there's Art and Victoria looking the way they do on the subway, just sitting there. Um, that's funny in itself, and then there's the moment where they come across somebody in an art costume. Um, that's funny in itself. There's this moment when they go to a house, and that's where they're going to stay for a bit, and Victoria has his horn, and he's, like, visibly annoyed. So, like, any that, that that's one of the expressions that Thornton has really, like, mastered, is when art looks annoyed. Um, is, is always funny when it happens. Um, there's the scene when he meets, uh, Santa, in quotes, at the bar, who is Daniel Roebuck, and he's there with Clint Howard, and that this is a whole sort of funny segment. This, that's another one of those long scenes I was talking about, like in the second movie, where you're waiting for it to escalate, but in the meantime, we just kind of get to be playful with it, and we get to meet new characters and see how he interacts, and we don't know what his next move is going to be. It picks up right at that level that 2 was at that I was loving and just continues right into it with this scene and and I love that and then there's moments where we get like the expression changes suddenly there's one where, like the bartender is like giving him shit and the Santa character is like you know wanting to have a drink with him and there's one great moment that's really quick where he's like glaring at the bartender and then the smile comes back when he turns to Santa and it's like just seeing how quickly he can change the big expressions um, is, like, really in full force here in this really great way. Um, there's even stuff that's, like... Sienna has a vision of her friend that died during the climax of the second movie, I think. Um, I don't think it was the bedroom kill girl. I think it was the other one. You can't tell because they've been so ripped to pieces. Um, but she has a vision of her at, like, the dinner table yelling at her and saying, like, I'm dead and this is your fault. Um, the, uh, something very disgusting and disturbing, but also darkly funny about this. Like, they really, they really found the dark comedy line and where it's disturbing and gross and funny at the same time. And it's just, yeah, it's just hitting at exactly the right tone it needs to get. And I can understand if it may have been hard to get there, because it's a very fine line. Um, but they they basically walked the tightrope, and now they can just... The tightrope is now a cakewalk for them, as far as the tone is being funny and revolting at the same time. And so that's really satisfying to see that they're just really... Especially with the franchise still being ongoing. It's like that's something, just in itself, how well they've got the tone down is when it's like okay, I'm on board for where we're going with this. Um, and that, that and from a story perspective also, because like I said, we've still got other developments going on with the dad backstory and, like, you know, is Sienna becoming a superhero or what's going on with that? Um, the good versus evil battle, how much of that's expanding. We're Like I said, I, I, I didn't plan on saying too much about the ending ending, but just, like, how far we're going, like, how big the scale's getting now... Um, this is normally something, I'm gonna be totally honest with you, normally it's something I don't really give much of a shit about. Um, whereas, like, world building and lore and stuff like that is something I typically could take or leave. Um, but this is so, given where we started, the characters involved, and all the different places we could be going, I feel, I'm starting to feel pretty all in on this. <laughs> so, um, this, and that's the thing, too, is, um... Not only do you have that, there's also the eerie factor is still here. There's one moment in this movie when we got there was really like, like it was like it, it's so I, I don't I, I I was like covered in chills thinking about it. It's um the fact that after we've had the moments from the end of the second movie, and then Art and Victoria unite, I guess. Um, like, it's not even a reunion, really, um, now that she's the Victoria that we know, the possessed Victoria that we know. So, they go to this house, and we think this is going to be, like, maybe their lair or something, 
And so this really creepy scene plays out where Art pulls up a rocking chair to a window in an attic and just sits and rocks and looks out the window while Victoria's in a bathtub self-mutilating. And then there was a five-year time jump. We're actually the, the five-year time jump was where we started with the scene where he kills the family in the first scene. And then we went back to the events of the second movie. And now this is where the five-year time jump is. And then we reintroduce Sienna and Jonathan and the new family members and what's going on with them, who they're staying with. Jonathan's in college now. She's with relatives. Um, there's like a nie cousin, niece, cousin. Uh, there's a new little girl that's like a major character. Um, and we see their interactions, and everything, and we see all the closeness now, and all the the new sets of characters that may or may not be um, future murder victims. And then we cut back to the house, knowing there's a five year time jump, and both Art and Victoria have not moved from where we left them. So Art is still in the rocking chair at the window, covered in cobwebs. And Victoria has been decomposing. That's... <laughs> you saw, like I said, that, that just really chilled me to the bone that they sat there for five years. <laughs> and one of them was collecting cobwebs and the other was decomposing. That's like, as a horror fan, that's the shit I live for. Especially because it caught me so off guard that we cut back and they were still fucking there. Um, I really love that. So, and then of course they come back, um, both of them, and then the main events of the movie happen. So, the main events of the movie haven't even really been set off, and I'm all in <laughs> uh, on what this movie's bringing. So, yeah. So, um, we, and there, yeah, there is a moment here. Um, where a after the ear, like I was talking about the eerie factor, which is not the same as like the, you know, the, the big stuff that's going on, just the stuff that like really gets under your skin unexpectedly like that did to me. Um, but then, yeah, we go big when they come back, which makes sense because uh, they're basically back with a vengeance. <laughs> so we have um, a moment where I was talking about where like the gore is the gore and it's pretty consistent. There is a moment that made me pretty lightheaded in this scene, which lately I've been using as a compliment for gore, because i cause watching so much horror now. Um, when Art, like, you know, pulls the skin off of the guy's head entirely. Um, that one that one got me for... Like, he's been doing that. <laughs> but um, this time in particular, it was, like, really just... I, I got a tiny bit dizzy there. Um... All at the same time, while what appears to be Victoria doing, um, do we want to call this glasturbation? Maybe that's I, I actually have not heard that. I don't know if somebody's already coined that, but uh, if they haven't, it's mine. Um, so I, I think that's what's uh, going on with Victoria. That that's maybe a little bit overkill, but you know we're we're just escalating and escalating, so why not? Um, so <laughs> so um, yeah, so we kind of bring back that theme I was talking about in the second movie, and we continue it, about the glorification of what's real and what's fake. So, the idea of this new character, who is the girlfriend of Jonathan's roommate, who runs a true crime podcast, and is obsessed with Sienna and Jonathan and what they went through with art, and wants to know all the details. Um, and so Sienna gets to go on this big tirade about how wrong that is, for many reasons. And so at first it was like, Oh, another character with a true crime podcast. Like we're we're do like we've had so many like that's like every modern day movie character at this point, especially in horror. Um, but it's like, but the the fact that the idea is that that is the thing is true crime podcasts and where we are with that as a culture now, um, and getting Sienna's thoughts on that as somebody that went through what she did in the second movie, her and Jonathan. Um, so it feels like kind of a continuation of that conversation we had about the second movie, that particular theme, carrying over into this one. So I like that that's sort of staying consistent also, um, not just as a talking point, but within the events of the movie and what the characters have been through by this point and how much it's playing a part in their lives now um, is something that I really like. So, well, and speaking of the podcast girl, I do love the moment when uh, 
talking about people who are really thirsty for this for some reason. And to get that scene where um, Art is standing outside the door and he's, like, listening into her, like, gushing about, you know, what would it be like to be right in front of him or something. And seeing his reactions play on that. Um, just more that. Like, he's really... Thorne's really leaning into the um, comedic body language here, too. And the more he does that, I feel like the better the character gets, the more entertaining the character gets. And, it's, and it's, it becomes more and more of a nice balance with how brutal... Um, his kills are and how much more like I said like hate filled art seems to become um, it's nice balance when you see those comedic elements with him so yeah there's um there's some memorable kills in this one as well um, we talked about the uh, the opening scene um, there's the scene with the uh, liquid nitrogen and the uh, bar uh, that was wild a, a way that like I said by that poster we knew Santa was getting defaced. Um, that's not how I imagined it, so that was a surprise. <laughs> um, and um, there is the um, there's the big mall scene, which has been talked about quite a bit already. And so, and that's I mean that scene just kind of is what it is. I feel like if that's something where you like you heard about it before you went in, it basically is how it's described. It's not that's what it like. Yeah, they're yeah children are fair game, but ch children are kind of always been fair game. So, like, all, the ending of All Hallows Eve set that up. So, um, there's that. But, um, the shower kill is another one that I feel like had a lot of, uh, build-up before people went into it. And, yeah, this is another one where I love the way it starts. Like I said, watching Art do mundane things, especially mundane things in relation to cleanliness. <laughs> so, um, the fact that we see we had the dishes scene earlier. Now we have Art taking a piss in the bathroom, and he has the common decency to wash his hands, despite the fact that his hands are constantly blood stained, and that never changes, no matter how many times he washes them. I like the fact that he apparently washes his hands after he pisses. Even Art the clown does it. So, um, if you're not hygienic, please take that into account. Even Art the clown washes his hands after taking a piss. So I like that detail quite a bit. Um, and then, yeah, we get into the kill itself. So this is another one where the brutality really sets in. Where, yeah, he kills him with a chainsaw. We've seen plenty of chainsaw deaths before. We've seen Leatherface do it. We saw Patrick Bateman drop one on somebody. Um, but... The brutality to this one is when he's killing the podcast girl with the chainsaw, it feels like like it's on and he's sawing her, but simultaneously it's like he's beating her with it while he's sawing at her. And it's like, you do get the sense, and especially when we get to the climax of the movie, like I said, I'm not sure if Leone's building to something with this, but it does just feel like art is more hate-filled and brutal as he goes. And like I said, the whole, like I was saying, I've been saying the whole time how Art the Clown has like a bullying angle within his brutal murders um, that goes beyond, you know, the the general sort of <laughs> brutality of gruesome murder, whatever it is. Like, if you've been watching, you get what I'm saying. But, um, and the fact that the whole ending with him and Victoria and the way they're treating the victims is basically bullying. Uh, before the kills happen, and it's, like I said, the brutality's really coming into it, but it's also, like I said, that over-the-top nature that separates it from feeling like it's coming from a mean-spirited place behind the scenes. Like it, like I said, that mean-spiritedness and that bullying nature feels like it's coming strictly from the characters, because we throw in these light moments. Like, even just the fact that, you know, the chainsaw up the ass thing, and the, and more... Um, is something that's, like, so over the top, and we'll get this sort of laugh-scream reaction from a crowd. Um, but we also throw in these little moments, like, um, when, after he's pulled the leg off in a very gruesome fashion, he, like, smells the foot and is disgusted by it, um, despite what's going on here. And, like, like, the clown mime stuff still going on during this, this is the kind of balance that we need for these scenes to not be too much. I mean, yeah, I guess no matter what they're too much, but it's not reprehensible 
because you know the tone that we're at and the dark comedy angle that we're at now. Um, and it's like you can see where the balance is with the brutality of what art is um, versus being entertaining to a horror audience. So then you get the moment where he does the snow angel in the blood. So there's clearly fun being had here amongst the brutality. Um, and so it's giving the audience, it's like it, it's punching the audience in the face, but then making it better, <laughs> making it feel better, I guess. Um, sounds like an unhealthy relationship, but it's, it's horror. So it's going to be brutal and it's, we're getting what we pay for. So that's what it is. Um, and, uh, and yeah, as far as climax goes, I love, um, Vicky and the makeup, uh, is a really good detail. And just that, that nature I was talking about with, um, the mom being aggressive in the second movie, but also the bullying nature of art. So there's this moment, these moments that keep happening in the climax where Sienna's tied to a chair and every time art walks by her, he smacks her in the back of the head. And it's like, not, I mean, and, and the more he does it, the funnier it gets. Um, so that's another thing where we're balancing the terror and the comedy. But I also feel like it has to be a callback to that moment where it's like the introductory scene of the mom in the second movie, where we're kind of establishing how kind of aggressive of a mom she is. And there is a moment where she smacks Sienna like that. Um, so it's almost, it's almost like he's reminding her of that um, on top of just bullying her in general <laughs> so that like i said there's something su such a deep-seated hatred in whatever entity art is if he's not just a personification of hatred and murder itself um like i said we're getting to really big places as this goes on but i think that's the most i want to say about the ending um but i guess um one other thing i'll just bring up real quick is um bringing in jason patrick to play the dad and having more flashbacks and playing into that like I said, that's something where it's like the more we're building this, the more I'm actually interested in where exactly we're going. Um, and we're putting more of an emotional context in it than you might expect. So, the, and, and character-driven aspect to it. So all of this is stuff I'm getting really interested in as this goes on. And I'm very interested to see what happens with 4, which to my understanding is very much on the way. So, uh... We'll see where this continues. They definitely set it up to see uh, where we're going. Obviously, this was still, as usual, very successful on that very tiny budget. So it'll be... And, and I think what, what especially helps me to be on board with this is I do know that Leone has said he knows what the ending is. It's just a matter of when it happens. But he knows what the ending is. That's something that gives me hope that... We're, we're not just going to go in some directionless franchise territory. The fact that there is apparently a full idea here. Like, he, he I think he even said he thinks he knows what the last shot is. Um, so that gives me a lot of hope for whatever is going to happen until we get to that point. So that's a big, that's a big plus to have when you're planning a franchise, is to know how it's going to end, and then you just have to get there. Um, that's That gives me a lot more hope than like a typical franchise than where we don't know what the ending's gonna be, um, or who's gonna take it over. So as long as we get to like Leone's ending, I will be here to see um where the hell we end up. So that's how I feel so far until the fourth one. So I'm gonna leave this at this. Um we're still playing catch up with uh the the October videos that I'm putting out. Um there's probably like maybe a week and a half's worth left, something like that. Um, so I'll get those out progressively over the first week of November, and then we will continue as normal. So uh, until the next thing, I think that's it.